Welcome to Musings from Arlet Solo Edition. We are, as you know, squarely within the dreaded off season. Uh, spring practice is over, the transfer portal is closed, uh, there are no practices going on. So we're gonna do a couple things over the next few months while we're waiting for the, uh, you know, the season to gear up again. We're gonna do a little bit of looking back. We're gonna to continue to have our one-on-one -on -one interviews. I, I think that next week we will probably have Shane Foley, former USC quarterback, who um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, his time in the 1980s, but we're also gonna spend a lot of time talking about Lincoln Riley's offense and Caleb Williams and what makes, uh, what makes that group special. Um, and we're gonna spend a little bit of time looking forward. I'm gonna mix in these interviews with some previews of USC's opponents for this coming season. Uh, instead of running through all of those consecutively, I'll mix in a couple per month, maybe two or three per month. Um, and uh, I'm gonna start that today. I'm gonna start with Stanford. What I'm gonna do with these, I'm gonna go through, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about the program, about the history of the program, some of the uh, some of the you know historic games that they've had with USC. I'll uh, I'll disclose where they rank on the musing scale of hatred. With one being a program that we don't really have any hard feelings towards, say uh, Bill Snyder's K State. Uh, they always seem like nice overachievers who would sometimes beat um, beat o uh, Oklahoma, which was nice. Um, so that's that's number one on the Arledge uh, or the musing scale of hatred. Number five, of course, being Oregon. So that's what we're going to do, starting uh, with Stanford. And yeah, I know Stanford's not the opening game. I'm not going to spin an episode on the two scrimmages. I'm not going to talk about San Jose State. I'm not going to talk about Nevada. If you're a fan of one of those programs, I apologize to you, but um, nobody involved with USC is interested in you. Those are just the two warm-up games that uh, give us a chance to get the the new transfers incorporated into the team and get the uh, machine running. Uh, okay, let's start with the Cardinal. Let's start with a little bit, a little bit of background on Stanford. Uh, Stanford was founded in 1885 by a robber baron, uh, Leland Stanford Sr. The university is named after his son, Leland Stanford uh, Jr., who actually died at a relatively young age while traveling in Italy. And so he named the, son, the, the university after his son. Uh, Senior Stanford was a hugely wealthy businessman, as you probably know. He was involved in railroads and shipping and various other business interests. Uh, he was a very prominent politician. He was governor of California. He was United States Senator from California. Uh, he was a big, big deal. And also a big deal is the donation he made to found Stanford, which would be worth over $1 billion in today's, uh, in today's uh, currency. Now, you might think that think that I brought up this robber baron thing to make fun of Stanford. It's actually not true for a couple reasons. One is I don't really have much of an issue with the 19th century robber barons. I mean, when you think about it, uh, those prominent businessmen from 150 years ago founded some pretty extraordinary institutions, Stanford being one of them. But listen, you've got uh, uh, Stanford Vanderbilt University, University of Chicago, uh, Carnegie Mellon, Duke, Rice. I mean, that's a pretty impressive list. I'm not going to beat up on those guys too much. I mean, uh, I wonder whether Bezos and, and Gates and those guys are going to leave institutions behind them that 150 years from now will have such extraordinary significance. Uh, maybe they will, but I question it. Um, the other thing is, it's really no fun to tweak today's college students about things like the fact that their university was founded by a robber baron. Because as you probably know, today's college students, they already hate everybody that lived 150 years ago. Because people who lived 150 years ago do not share exactly all of the cultural and political and philosophical beliefs that today's affluent 20 year old picked up 18 minutes ago and have concluded are self-evident. So they already hate these guys. So it's really no fun to make fun of them. They already, they're already there trying to knock down their statues and stuff. Um, so uh, so that's the, the background on Stanford. Now the truth is Stanford and USC have had a ton of big time, uh, big time classics over the years. You had some of the devastating games. Look, you already know number one on that list, which um, number two USC 
uh, under Pete Carroll losing to a 40-point underdog Stanford team. It doesn't get much worse than that. You had the shocking tie in 79 that, that probably stopped USC from uh, uh, probably stopped USC from uh, being uh, unanimous number one uh, at that point. You had the, um, the three overtime heartbreak in 2011 where USC fumbled in the third overtime through the end zone, cost them the game. Uh, and of course you have a ton of glorious USC victories over Stanford. USC usually beats Stanford and they have for, for many years. You had Rodney Pete coming back in 1988 to keep the uh, undefeated season alive. You had Keyshawn Johnson catching the post route with about 40 seconds left in the game against Stanford in 1995. You had Coach O being carried off the field in 2013 when his, his defense really put in one of the gutsiest efforts you'll ever see from a college team uh, against a really good Stanford team and one on a last second field goal. Um, lots of great games between these two. Part of that is the nature of Stanford, which we'll get into in just a minute. Um, but let's start by saying this, because I'm going to disappoint a lot of USC fans right now, and I don't mean to, but I can't help it. I have a hard time hating Stanford. I know there are USC fans that hate Stanford. I know John McKay famously hated Stanford. He, he wanted to beat Stanford by 2,000 points. He told his kid, JK and Pat Hayden, when they were talking about possibly going to Stanford, that if it was became between Stanford and Red China, that he would pay their way to, um, uh, to Peking. Um, what animated John McKay 50 years ago in his hatred of Stanford is hard for me to get worked up about. Now, here's the reality. Stanford has an annoying culture. We'll talk about that. Uh, they're a little bit weird in some ways. But here's the thing. Let's face it. The kids who choose to play Stan uh, football at Stanford are making a pretty good life choice. And it's hard to criticize them too much. I mean, look at it this way. Generally speaking, to get into Stanford, you have to have absolutely sterling academic qualifications, or very rich and powerful parents, or both. Both helps. Um, most football players who go to Stanford don't. They're good students, but they would never, ever get in if they weren't football players. They just, they, they, uh, and Stanford's own uh, student newspaper did, uh, did something on this some years ago, showing the gap between the average student at Stanford and the football and basketball players. And you're talking about hundreds of points on the SAT. So I want you to think about this. You're talking for the most part about kids who are good students, but not spectacular students, who have decided to leverage their athletic ability in order to acquire an elite degree and, uh, and, and make lifelong contacts with people who are gonna go on to be CEOs and United States Senators and all the rest. That strikes me as pretty smart. I don't have a problem with that. How much better is that than, than leverage your athletic abilities to go to a school whose primary selling point is they have lots of dope uniforms and cool facilities, right? I'm not gonna beat up on these kids. No, Stanford's culture, little bit more dicey. Here's the thing, Stanford wants to win. They do. Stanford could have given up on, uh, on major college football a long time ago, like the Ivies did, right? They just chose not to compete. University of Chicago, once a football power, academic powerhouse, they've chosen not to compete. Uh, even Rice and Vanderbilt, who have chosen to remain at the D1 level, uh, are content just to be uh, cannon fodder every single year, right? Stanford actually is a little bit different. Uh, Stanford has chosen to actually try to win. The problem is Stanford is embarrassed that they're trying to win at major college football. They realize that there are some shortcuts they have to take. They realize there are some philosophies they claim to have that they have to put on the back burner a little bit in order to compete. So what they do is they cut the corners, but they don't cut the corners as much as say Alabama or Florida State would. And then they try to convince people that they don't care all that much, so it looks like they're above the fray. That's what Stanford does. This, by the way, if you're a USC fan, this sounds familiar, because this is the same trick that Notre Dame plays now, right? Notre Dame tries to pretend that they're above the, uh, they're above the corruption and above the nonsense, and that their other values they prize more heavily. At least they've, they've acted that way since Lou Holtz left. While Holtz was there, they were all in on the cheating. But since then, they've tried to make it uh, sound as if they, they care about other things more than winning. But don't kid yourself, they, they wanna win. Stanford does too. 
And that attitude can be more than a little bit annoying, as I said earlier, because uh, it lends itself to a program that's trying, but wants to pretend that it's not trying. That way, if you beat them, they act like you didn't really accomplish very much. That's not cool. Um, and it shows up in all aspects of, of what you see from Stanford on a game day. L the fact that they have this ridiculous dancing Christmas tree as a mascot. It's, it's a way of showing really disdain for you know, college traditions and the like. Um, it's ridiculous. The Stanford band, same thing. Look, Stanford doesn't have to have a band. They want to. And it matters to them, right? I mean, the Stanford band really matters. It's a prestigious institution on campus. But they choose to do it in such a way to make it look like they don't care. So instead of looking good and, um, and, and, and being disciplined and playing well, instead of all that stuff, they come out dressed like clowns and they act like clowns and they just give everybody in the world the giant middle finger. That's the Stanford way. They wanna play the game, but they wanna pretend like they're not playing the game. That's not great. It's not enough for me to hate them, but it is enough for me to say that, uh, that their attitude needs a little bit of adjustment. And from time to time, say every September, they need to take a beat down from USC just to teach them a lesson. Now the problem is, they don't always get that lesson. Stanford's not an elite program, right? They are not Ohio State or Oklahoma. They know that, we know that, everybody knows that. But it's not true to say that Stanford can't compete. Um, there was a, um, it was a pro, pro Football Hall of Fame put out an article um, ranking all the college football programs of all time. Stanford 28th amongst the major programs. I mean, that's not bottom feeder level. It's a lot higher than say Oregon and other traditional bottom feeders are. Um, now a lot of that success was pre-World War II, but not all of it. I mean, Stanford is a program that has won Heisman trophies and has won Rose Bowls. They're, they're occasionally able to compete. Their academic standing means that they cannot compete for athletes the same way that Oklahoma or Alabama would. Okay, But it also means that for certain types of recruits, Stanford is unbelievably difficult to beat. If you have a kid who really, uh, an academically minded kid who can play division one football and really wants to get an elite degree, Stanford is going to be an extraordinarily um, uh, favorable choice for that kid. And so for a lot of those students, Stanford can be the toughest uh, program to beat in the country. What that means is that Stanford does occasionally get some great football players, uh, particularly quarterbacks and offensive linemen, uh, positions where there's a whole lot of, uh, uh, of thinking involved. And they do very well uh, so that occasionally Stanford can put together very strong rosters. USC and Notre Dame, two Stanford rivals, know this very well because both Blue Bloods have been stung by Stanford on many occasions. Stanford at its best is like Silicon Valley. It's a program that is innovative and it's been coached by some of the greatest innovators of all time. Pop Warner, for example, who came up with, uh, with not only some of the offensive formations that led to the shotgun and other things that we know today, Pop Warner invented the three-point stance. I mean, Pop Warner was foundational for modern football, a, a tremendous innovator. Uh, Bill Walsh. Bill Walsh, uh, as much as anybody, deserves credit for inventing modern offense uh, and, and uh, also a great innovator. Even Jim Harbaugh, when he was at Stanford, who isn't normally thought of as a great innovator because his team's uh, his teams, uh, at least at that time, played that smash mouth brand of football that even Woody Hayes would have thought might be a little bit outdated. But Harbaugh understood something that, that made it work. Harbaugh understood that just about everybody else was going to the spread. They were, they were going the Oregon model. They were putting a lot of fast guys out there and spreading them all over the field, which means the defenses were starting to go to base, base alignments that were, uh, that were nickel-based and, uh, and had a lot more, uh, and they started recruiting and developing a lot of players who were smaller and faster than, than in the old days. And what, what Jim Harbaugh figured out, his innovation, so to speak, was realizing that teams that are made to stop Oregon spread are gonna have a hard time dealing with the three tight end, two back Stanford offense. And, and that worked very well for him for a while. So Stanford at its best is innovative. 
Uh, it's Jim Plunkett winning uh, winning Rose Bowls. It's Jim Harbaugh and Andrew Luck winning the Orange Bowl. Uh, that's Stanford at its best. Stanford at its worst is under talented, under supported, and just frankly hard to watch. When Stanford's bad, Stanford tends to be bad, and and that's what we're going to see this year. So let's talk a little bit about this coming game. Stanford is awful, awful. There was a slow, um, there was a slow descent once Jim Harbaugh left Stanford. It's not that David Shaw wasn't a good coach. I actually think he is a good coach. But what he's not is he is not a guy who is innovative and he could not keep the talent level at the level that it was when Harbaugh was there. And so as Stanford started its natural descent back into a mediocre program, uh, David Shaw continued to trot out the same offense Stanford had been running for a very long time uh, with, with offensive linemen, running backs, and especially quarterbacks that just weren't nearly as good. And, and that was disastrous. Um, he wasn't able to change. Whereas Harbaugh himself, if you look and see what he did at Michigan, Harbaugh has dramatically changed his offense sort of the way, uh, sort of the way Nick Saban did. It's not that they don't care about running the ball, they do but he understood that we can't continue to play this way and have success. Shaw never adjusted. And so you had what we saw last year, which was Stanford was three and nine and just embarrassingly bad. And to make things even worse, Stanford has the fewest number of returning players in the Pac-12 this year, which means that Stanford has almost no talent and almost no experience. So what Stanford's gonna get this year from USC is a magnificent beatdown. And they're gonna deserve it. They're gonna deserve it because it's gonna be partial payback for the what's your deal game and some of the other uh, monstrosities that, uh, that have come up in this series over the years. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time analyzing Stanford USC this year for that reason. We'll talk about Washington and Oregon and Notre Dame and some of these other teams that are much better. Stanford, you don't have anything to worry about Trojan fans. You have San Jose State and Nevada and Stanford, and those first three games are games where teams are gonna be dramatically overmatched and simply can't play with USC. That game will be a bloodbath. Enjoy it. Stanford could use a bloodbath like that every once in a while. Uh, and of course, Stanford will bring almost nobody to the game, and after it's over, they'll act like they didn't really care anyway, because that's Stanford being Stanford. But that's fine. This may be the last time in a long time we get to beat up on those guys, so let's enjoy it. Okay, that's it for the Stanford preview. Next week, like I said, uh, should be Shane Foley, and uh, we'll continue to work in uh, our interviews and our uh, season previews. Uh, that's it for today. Fight on.